Hello everyone, here we are again, another Insights Lecture. Thank you for welcoming us into your office, home, or wherever you're tuning in. We're practically old friends at this point, but in case you don't know me, my name is Joe Komsky and I'm the Senior Director of Philanthropy at Sanford Burnham Previs. A couple of quick thank yous off the top. We're pleased today to announce a partnership with the Doris A. Howell Foundation. For the past 25 years, the Howell Foundation has been dedicated to making a long-term positive impact on women's health as the premier organization in advancing women's health research and education. The Howell Foundation has supported this research by funding over 300 graduate and undergraduate scholarships in this research area. The Howell Foundation's motto is keeping the women we love healthy, and we are pleased that their members are able to join us today. I have a couple of other thank yous you know, I'm the one on screen here all the time, and I know I make it look easy, but there's a lot of people behind the scenes that make this happen. I in particular want to thank Susan Gammon, James Short, and Natasha Giusti, who help with the prep and the webinar setup and all of that, and particularly want to thank Heather Boothman Requejo from our philanthropy department, who is instrumental in setting up all of these uh, lectures and helping to prep our scientists. Thank you to all of you. You guys are the ones who make it happen. I'm just the one who signs the autographs. We conduct research in a lot of different areas here at Sanford Burnham Previs. Cancer, addiction, neurodegenerative diseases, aging, the list goes on. Today, we're going to discuss research that we do on diseases that impact more than 50% of the human race, diseases that primarily or exclusively affect women. Some of these issues are well known and we're going to provide information on two of them, breast and ovarian cancer. But did you know that women are more likely to be affected by autoimmune diseases? We're going to hear from a scientist today who's working to understand why this is and identify targets for treatment. But before we learn from our scientists, we have a very, very special guest. Helen Ekman is a longtime supporter of Sanford Burnham Prebis. She is a multiple cancer survivor and a member of our Cancer Center Advisory Board. She also helps cancer centers around the country as a patient advocate and advisor on grant applications. We asked Helen to join us today to share her story and illustrate the importance of the research that we do. Welcome, Helen. Hi, I'm just delighted to be here today and I'm delighted to be alive. And I'm really happy to tell everybody my age. I'll be 72 in June because I've survived breast cancer since I was 42. So I am a long hauler in the good sense. And um, they told me that they had seen something on my mammogram when I was 42, but they said, oh, just don't worry about it. And uh, about two weeks later, I got this feeling in my heart, yeah, worry about it. So I went in and insisted on a needle location biopsy. And I really had to be quite forceful to make that happen. And it turned out that at that point, I already had metastasized breast cancer and then it had moved to the lymph system. So uh, my first thing to say is, if you get an inclination about something, speak up. Um, I went through um, chemo radiation. I had a recurrence when I was 49 years old, five years later, and I went through a double mastectomy. And I tried a support group. I tried going to support groups, but it just didn't work for me. I know it's very successful for many people, but for me, it just, that's not how I was wired. So I went into Stanford Burnham and I met with Dr. Christine Yavore, who is my hero. And um, I was so excited to meet with her. And she put me on her community advisory board where I have served for the last 17, 19, 20 years. We've lost count. And um, when I was 65, I had another recurrence of breast cancer and it had metastasized to my bone. And I do have to say all of that sounds horrible, but I feel fantastic. <laughs> and I, feel, I have all the energy in the world. In fact, my husband's like, slow down. And so it turns out, this is the last point I'm gonna make, is that it turns out the medication that I am now on that is saving my life with very few side effects was actually being, the basic research was being done at Sanford Burnham the day that I met Dr. Yavori all of those years ago. So I just wanna bring it full circle that what they're doing saves lives like mine. That's all I have to say. And you can all see why we love Helen, and she is such a wonderful uh, supporter. If you have a question for Helen, uh, there's a Q&A button on the bottom, and I will relay those to her. Um, Helen, for me, though, real quick, the, yes. um, you know, it, it's, what we do here is a lot of that foundational basic research. Right. Um, 
and a lot of people don't understand that it's that work that is without that work, the, the other folks who are who are creating who are doing the last stages of the work can't can't do that, right? They can't create those those drugs and things. And you've seen a lot of that with your work for cancer centers around the country. Yes, so now I'm a layman, and so I'm sure all the doctors are going to cringe when I use this analogy. But for me, um, what the, what is happening at Stanford Burnham is they're doing the basic molecule research, the basic work that determines how this gene interacts with this gene and how this all works, and then how these compounds that they're trying affects it um, differently. And so that work is done at Stanford Burnham and often paid for by the the government and, and, and the National Institute of Health and also all of us do supports them with other contributions. But I just wanna say that that basic research is not generally done by the people who make the medicines later. The basic research is really how the body reacts. And so that's important and this is what they're doing. So if without that, nothing else happens. It's, um, it's the number one thing, <laughs> so. <laughs> Helen, thank you as always for being a staunch advocate for us. You, you, okay. You also, real quick, just uh, and I know you need to get back because you're you're part of another cancer center. Sedation, uh, uh, as we speak. <laughs> yes, exactly. But if you can just tell us a little bit, I, just for people's interest, that the role that you play for Sanford Burnham Preppers and other cancer centers in terms of, I, I touched on it in the introduction, but you can give us better details on it. You know, sure. For grants, etc. So. I'm an advocate for breast cancer, so I will do whatever it takes. So the cancer researchers contact me, and if they need to have a letter or if they need somebody to oversee one of their grants, I'm there. Um, I work in the community advisory board. We do amazing work in that we offer these events uh, twice a year where people can actually virtually or physically come in and visit the different um, research centers and see what we're doing. And um, we also work on... Um, helping the scientists be able to communicate to the general public the work that they're doing because what they're doing is so sophisticated and so complicated that most people can't get it and so I'm a really good interpreter of saying I don't know what that means <laughs> tell me make that turn that into a picture turn that into a diagram <laughs> and the scientists are doing it. and what you're going to see today is these excellent scientists are doing this really complicated work and they've turned it in a language that we can understand and it's such a blessing <laughs> You're, you're, we talk, I, talk, I call it uh, translating science into English. Yes, that's what we do sometimes. it's marvelous. Uh, Helen, we had two questions for you real quick before we let you go. One, someone asked, what was the name of the doctor that you met with? And someone asked if you didn't mind sharing what medication you're on. Okay, I'm, I'm using something called Affinitor um, and Extamestane. Those are the two life-saving drugs I'm on and um, just doing fantastic. I can't tell you how good I feel. And um, let's see, but the other question, I'm sorry, Joe, what was the first question? Uh, the name of the doctor that you met. I work with Dr. Shatsky, S-H-A-T-S-K-Y at UCSD. And I met her through Sanford Burnham. I was with another cancer doctor who will remain nameless. And um, I was meeting with one of the researchers there and, and Shat Dr. Shatsky was there. And I I looked at her and I said, can you be my doctor? And so just after meeting her and all of the wonderful work she's doing and how she works with researchers, I, I, I've been very happy working with her and uh, she's going to keep me alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, Helen, we're, we're glad for all of it. Uh, the research and the doctors who have uh, kept you alive and you've been able to help so many more people and, and pay it back. And we hope it's going to that it's another 30 years that, uh, that you're just, still around helping us all. I am a full-time professor and I just signed another five-year contract. So I'm well, a woman who lives only five years, health. right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Helen, so much. And uh, we're going to move on to our other scientists. Each of our scientists, uh, as Helen talked about the research they're doing, they're going to talk about their research. Um, they will take five to 10 minutes to describe the work that they're doing. And we will take questions for the scientists immediately after their presentation. And then we'll move on to the next speaker. After all of our speakers present, time permitting, we'll bring them all back on and take more questions from you. So first up is Dr. Swasti Haracharan. 
Spasti is an assistant professor at Sanford Burnham Previs, and she has over 10 years of research experience in breast cancer development and treatment response. Her research focus is on the activities of DNA repair proteins in tumor initiation, progression, and treatment response, and she has some exciting advances to share. Welcome, Dr. Hara Charn. Thank you. I'm very excited to be sharing some of my research with um, all of you today. So thank you for Burnham and Joe and the rest of the crew for organizing um, this really lovely event. So as Joe said, I mainly work on breast cancer and I work on DNA damage repair and breast cancer. Why do I work on breast cancer? Well, basically every 19 seconds somewhere in the world, a woman finds out that she has breast cancer. It is one of the most common cancer diagnoses for women anywhere in the world today. And we've all, or most of us, have probably heard of the statistic that one in eight women gets breast cancer. And that statistic is only becoming um, worse with time. And what is interesting to us, or one of the focuses of research in our lab, is that one in three women who get breast cancer has treatment-resistant disease. So the treatments that we are able to offer women who have breast cancer at the clinic are quite effective. However, 30% of breast cancer patients just don't respond to them or evolve to become resistant to the treatments that are available. So one of the questions we're interested in is why does this happen? Why do we see treatment resistance? And in trying to study this was how we stumbled across DNA damage repair as a major player in this game, because what we found was when we looked at tumors from women with treatment resistant breast cancer, we could see that 20% or at least one in five women with treatment resistant breast cancer has defects in the DNA damage repair pathways in their tumors. And so my lab basically studies why this happens and what it means in terms of how can we treat these women more effectively um, and with fewer side effects. So I'm just gonna give a sort of basic understanding of what DNA damage repair is and why it's important. During every day of our lives, our cells replicate many, many times. This just means that they divide so that one cell becomes two. And every time that happens, DNA damage repair is essential for making sure that all the DNA that has been replicated in order to make two cells is undamaged and whole. Because if DNA damage persists in the genome, you end up with mutations, and these mutations are what often results in the formation and progression of cancer. And this is in the absence of all of the external stimuli that induce further mutations and further DNA damage, like exposure to sunlight, exposure to various toxins, exposure to smoke if you're a smoker, um, foods that we eat, et cetera. So even in the absence of those uh, mutagens, basically DNA damage repair is absolutely necessary for normal growth. But what we've found is that cancer cells can actually take these fundamental DNA repair pathways and co opts them to their own advantage to produce escape mechanisms from treatment. So basically, the treatments that we give the patients, these DNA damage repair pathways can be co-opted to induce escape pathways that then make the tumor resistant to those treatments. So one of the projects, one of our most recent projects, which is being uh, transformed into a clinical trial right now, is that we noticed that when we looked at breast cancer that was proficient for DNA damage repair or had strong DNA damage repair. We found these red areas in the cells where you can see the red arrows that are pointing it out, which are areas that proteins go to get destroyed or degraded. And what we found in DNA repair proficient breast cancer was that when we gave them standard treatment, these proteins that induced growth, which, were, which are green in color here, get targeted to these areas of degradation so that they basically get destroyed. So the standard treatment makes sure that the proteins that are promoting growth get completely destroyed. However, when you look at the DNA repair defective breast cancer, you can now see that when we give them standard treatment, those green proteins are still persisting. So they're not getting targeted to those areas of destruction and being removed. So what we were able to do using existing treatments that are available to us today, um, but are not used standardly for women with breast cancer, we were able to find such an existing treatment that could degrade that green protein that induced growth. 
So what you can see here is, um, is the growth of a few cancer cells. And as you can see in the top row, the DNA repair profession breast cancer, you see these big globules, which are more or less circular. And when we treat them with standard treatment, you see that the globules start shrinking and become really, really circular and small. And that's how you know it's responding to treatment. However, in the DNA repair defective cells in the bottom, you'll first of all notice that even without treatment, these are much bigger than the DNA repair proficient ones, and they have these huge protrusions. These protrusions are what eventually results in disease recurrence and metastasis. And when we treat these cells with standard treatment, we see that although they respond a little bit, they don't become very small and those protrusions still persist, so they don't become circular. But when we take this personalized treatment that we know is already available in the clinic, but just not used for breast cancer patients, and we treat these cells, we now see that they respond almost as well or actually even better than standard treatment in the DNA repair proficient breast cancer cells. And as Helen was pointing out, none of this research happens in a vacuum. And so we actually collaborate not just with informaticians who can look at patient tumors and give us ideas of what to test or what treatments are good, but also clinicians, including Dr. Shatsky, whom Helen uh, mentioned, but also Dr. Shao, whom we're setting up a clinical trial with right now to test the personalized treatment I was talking about earlier, as well as patient advocates, including Helen, but also Karen, who works with us, um, and Ruth who we have quite a few patient advocates because they are really the heartbeat of our lab in directing the really important questions that we need to ask. So I'm gonna end with, with hope because I think what we're doing now in Burnham and many other places is actually identifying these existing therapies that we can match really quickly and efficiently um, to the right patient, to the right woman, so that she responds most effectively. And this is the future of precision medicine, which I think actually Fabiana, my colleague, will be talking about um, shortly as well. Svasti, thank you uh, so much. So a couple of questions. Um, so you showed in the pictures that the DNA repair deficient cancer cells looked very different than the, um, the ones that weren't, that didn't have the DNA repair. Does that mean that there's some sort of test that we can do early on to see if someone has the DNA repair deficient type of cancer? Yeah, absolutely. And so this is one of the things we're advocating for, actually, is to take these tests, which are already done for patients with colorectal cancer and ovarian cancer, but they're just not done in the clinic for breast cancer patients, because this is just an underappreciated mechanism. But what we're advocating for is for routinely using those tests to detect right at diagnosis um, that a tumor is DNA repair deficient so that we know that this is going to be more aggressive, it's going to be less responsive to standard of care, and it's going to need alternate therapies. And so giving the clinician that heads up right at the beginning, instead of going through years and years of treatment cycles that are failing, giving the tumor opportunities to grow more and more and um, start evading treatment, that's where we're headed. And that's one of the things we're testing with this clinical trial with Dr. Shao. So to be clear and to simplify it, your lab, because of the work that you're doing, we may be able to avoid sort of very damaging, useless treatments for breast cancers and get right to a personalized treatment. Now, are you also working on those kind of personalized treatments that may... Uh, yeah, so actually, there's a couple that we're working on. One of my favorites, or at least one of the favorites of all of the patient advocates we work with is uh, an extract from Brussels sprouts, which has almost no side effects and activates a, a hugely important pathway for DNA repair defective um, tumors. So basically taking this low side effect, almost nutraceutical or supplement that you can, you can buy it um, on Amazon for like 10 bucks and get like 3000 pills that you can have, right? Um, and the idea is that we can actually use things like that once we understand what it's targeting, once we understand the protein that we're targeting it to, we can use it optimally for the right patient. So actually we're wait, working with Burnham um, to develop more specific drugs that mimic the activity of that nutraceutical that can actually be used in clinic. And the DNA repair defective cells, is this only in cancer or can somebody have DNA repair defective cells that are affecting them in other ways as well? 
yeah, DNA repair defects actually have so many pathologies associated with them, including really simple ones like infertility um, and then really complex ones like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's where we don't know the direct links, but we know that they're associated. One of the things that I find uh, amazing about the human body is that as we get older, the amount of DNA repair protein we have in each cell keeps decreasing. So it's like you're born with a certain store of DNA repair proteins. And then as you get older, you start eroding that store. And as you do, you're more likely to get mutations. You're more likely. And, and I think that's one of the reasons cancer is an aging disease, because as we grow older, the protections just keep decreasing, which makes the likelihood of you getting cancer higher. Uh, we have a question from our audience. Uh, by DNA repair, do you mean BRCA and related genes or also MMR as in Lynch syndrome? That's an excellent question. Um, I will say I'm a, we're a standout lab because we don't study BRCA, which is probably the best known DNA damage repair pathway for breast cancer. But we do study mismatch repair. And that's one of the things, uh, one of the pathways that we focus on with the Lynch syndrome spectrum, but also with um, uh, other associated proteins that are not specifically in the mismatch repair pathway, but work very similarly um, to it. So in the nucleotide excision repair and base excision repair pathways. But so far we have not studied BRCA and, and we're not really planning on doing it either. There's lots more people doing that that we don't need to enter that field. Svasti, thank you very much. This has been fascinating. We will bring you back. So if other people have questions, they can put them in our, uh, our Q&A box. And our next speaker is Dr. Fabiana Lang. Dr. Lang is a postdoctorate associate in our cancer center. Her postgraduate graduate medical training focused on women's health, particularly obstetrics and gynecology and gynecologic oncology. Fabiana's current research investigates mechanisms of cancer cell growth, survival and resistance to targeted therapy in ovarian and lung cancer to guide the development of new cancer treatments. Dr. Lang, welcome, please go ahead. And hello, uh, thank you, Joe, for the introduction. And thank you all for participating in the event today. And also I'd like to thank uh, everybody who's involved in, in organizing this event as well. So as Joe said, uh, my research uh, focuses on cancer drug resistance and specifically in ovarian and lung cancer. So as I said, why do we study cancer drug resistance? And drug resistant remains one of the biggest challenges in cancer therapy, and it continues to be the principal limiting factor to achieving cures in patients with cancer. And indeed, most of cancer deaths result from drug resistance. And once cancer cells, they stop responding to treatment, of course, they would grow back and then disease relapses and, and progresses. Drug resistance exists across all types of cancer and all modes of treatment, including target therapy, chemotherapy, and immunotherapy. And multiple factors within cancer cells themselves and in the local environment in which cancer cells exist contribute to how well uh, a drug works. As you can see here in the figure, tumors are made of different cells, and those cells, they have different sensitivities to treatment. And although the drugs, they might kill most of cancer cells, almost invariably a group of cells survive, su survive the treatment and allowing, allowing cancer cells to grow back and leading to disease relapse and cancer progression. And cancers, they often have multiple mechanisms for surviving and growing, which may change over time and in response to treatment. And as I said, I specifically studied those uh, uh, survival mechanisms in ovarian and lung cancer. Uh, ovarian cancer is not as common as breast cancer. However, ovarian cancer causes more deaths than any other gynecological cancer. And all women of all ages, they are at risk for ovarian cancer, with one in 78 women developing ovarian cancer in her lifetime. And of course, the risk of ovarian cancer is higher uh, as if a woman presents a breast cancer gene or a BRCA mutation, uh, as we mentioned before. And with a BRCA mutation, her lifetime ovarian cancer risks is between 30 to 50%. And one of the reasons why ovarian cancer is so deadly is because most of patients are diagnosed at advanced stages 
and when the disease has already spread out of the ovaries. And in addition, more than 50% of ovarian cancer patients, they will relapse after a year, uh, uh, within a year after initial treatment with surgery and chemotherapy due to resistance to current treatment regimens. And what about lung cancer and women's health? So although men, especially smokers, they make up the majority of lung cancer diagnosis and uh, cigarette smoking remains the greatest risk factor for lung cancer, 60 to 70% of women diagnosed with lung cancer have never smoked in their lifetime. And uh, there, is, there are several risk factors that we can imply uh, 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 in non-smokers that develop uh, lung cancer, and that include secondhand uh, tobacco smoke, uh, some environmental exposures such as asbestos, some lung diseases, for example, uh, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, and there's also some hormones, including estrogen, which is the main uh, female hormone. Uh, we still do not fully understand uh, the role of estrogen in lung cancer, and if actually there is a direct association between estrogen levels and risk of developed lung cancer. What we do know now is that lung cancer cells, they do respond to estrogen stimuli which means that lung cancer cells, they do have estrogen receptors on their surfaces. And because of those estrogen receptors on the surface of lung cancer cells, uh, uh, estrogen might have a role in lung cancer cell proliferation and tumor growth. And similar to ovarian cancer, 30 to 50% of patients uh, with lung cancer, they will relapse and die due to drug resistance. And specifically uh, uh, research on drug resistance, we need to, to, to keep in mind that uh, cancer is a, dynamic is a dynamic disease. So uh, we are always uh, considering that cancers are evolving ex ecosystems. So as you can see here in the figure, this is a tumor and tumors that they only don't have tumor cells, cancer cells, they have other cells as well. For example, fibroblasts, which are cells from our connective tissue and tumors also have immune cells and have different types of immune cells. So all those cells together in the tumor, they're either competing with each other, but most likely they are collaborating with each other to to foster tumor growth. So based on that, our lab researchers on how ovarian and lung cancer cells uh, adapt and change their surroundings in response to treatment. So we basically map cancer changes over time and its treatment responses. And by doing that, our major goals are to mitigate this tumor adaptation and consequently drug resistance, and we also want to anticipate those changes in order to improve uh, 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 therapies. For example, to improve adaptive cancer therapy uh, uh, strategies. So for the adaptive cancer therapy, we um, uh, different treatment strategies, they are uh, combined according to the current state of tumor growth. So there is a continuous adjustment of doses, drugs, and timing to maximize the, the clinical benefits. And then we can prolong the period until the tumor becomes resistant to, to treatment. And we also want to improve anti-cancer immune response. And how can we do that? So one of the, the, one of the example of tumor adaptation largely applied by lung cancer cells and also ovarian cancer cells is escape from our immune system. And as you can see here, like the immune cell is kind of like having some, some problems in identifying a healthy cell from a cancer cell. And our immune system defends our body against uh, pretty much anything that it's considered harmful. So against bacteria, viruses, and also cancer cells. However, 
cancer cells, they apply several mechanisms to escape from our immune system. And this degree of evasion varies according to several factors, including treatment. So by studying on how cancer, uh, cancer involves as well, adjusting, constantly adjusting the types of drugs, doses, and timing, we can also amplify the ability of our immune system to recognize and kill cancer cells. So here, our, our immune system can easily identify cancer cell as, as harmful. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for taking your time to, to join our event. I would like to thank my uh, principal investigator, Dr. Nicholas Cosford, and our lab, all the members of the Cosford lab. I would like to, to thank our funding agencies. And if you have any questions that I might not be able to answer today, or if you have any questions afterwards, please feel free to email me. It's flane, fsfriend, uh, lane as L-A-Y, and as Navy G-S-I at sbpdiscover.org. Thank you. Aviana, thank you so much. There's, there's a lot of interesting stuff that's going on here. I think one that I think your last slides that people need to realize is how effective cancer cells are from hiding from our immune system. As Svasti talked about, there's a lot of, you know, our cells mutate or have problems all the time. And generally our immune system is good about um, repairing those, but somehow cancer seems to be able to, uh, to evade that. So part of that work you're doing, I think would be very important to help the immune system uh, be able to recognize those cells, correct? Yes, uh, exactly. And also, uh, uh, we all uh, have like how immunotherapy ha actually has changed uh, cancer, uh, cancer treatment, right? But immunotherapy, we know that uh, patients, they don't respond as, as, as good as like, like usually there's an average of 20% of response to immunotherapy. So by doing that also, we can improve the, the response to immunotherapies. Like we want to, 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 to literally uh, uh, go and point out, look, like, cancer cells are here, please go and, and kill them. So um, quick question about the drug resistance. So my mm -hmm. understanding now is if you've got cancer, they, they give you a drug and at some point they just give you that drug until it stops working and then they move to another drug and they give you that until it stops working. So is the idea here to find drugs that may adapt as the cancers adapt? Yes, like, uh, so the idea is we might not be able to completely eradicate uh, cancer cells, cancer, but keep cancer under control. So there is a constant, like the grow, uh, the cancer doesn't grow. But that's why we need to adjust drugs. Uh, and even when we are developing new drugs, we need to, to find the relationship between the drugs, between cancer cells, and between all the environment, uh, in, in between the environment. So we might not be able, so the cancer might not be able to completely disappear. However, if we keep, still keep cancer cells that are still sensitive to treatment, those sensitive cells, they can keep the resistant cells in check because it's more uh, the resistant cells, they, 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 they have more work to do in order to, to be resistant, right? So they, they, they have to work harder in order to survive. So, but if we keep sensitive cells around them, so those sensitive, sensitive cells, they are able to keep those resistant cells in check. So even though the tumor is already there, the tumor is not growing, growing, growing. And this is especially, this is, uh, this is um, really um, uh, helpful in patients who are, for example, ovarian cancer patients and even lung cancer patients that they are diagnosed in advanced stages. So we know that the tumor is, has already, it might have already spread out. But even we can control this spread with those different treatment strategies, the, the patient is able to have a, a, a great quality of life with the tumor in check, even though the, the cancer is already there. So it's, it's a chronic disease, for example, you're living with a chronic disease. So your work hopefully will lead to better survival rates with uh, for ovarian cancer. Yes, potentially. yes. Um, I want to 
delve a little bit more into the specific cancers. You said that 60% um, of women who have lung cancer have never smoked. Do women who smoke have a greater risk of lung cancer than men who smoke? Uh, no, not, not necessarily because um, the, the, the statistics, because even the women, like they, of course, uh, they have changed their habits. They have never smoked uh, as much as men. And so the, the rates are, are, are equal between smokers and uh, between smokers in general, regardless of gender. Um, but what we do know, like uh, women, uh, people who have never smoked, they have different types of cancers, different type of lung cancers in comparison with people who smoke. There's also those differences. But even though the, the good news is that uh, women who have never smoked, they have like a specific type of lung cancer, they also respond better to treatment in comparison to no smokers, to, in comparison to smokers, for example. Um, and then a question about ovarian cancer, and, and it sounds like there are similarities between ovarian cancer and, for example, pancreatic cancer, one being that by the time it's sort of diagnosed, um, it is spread and there's, so it's at a more advanced stage. Uh, are there, will there be kinds of, will there be tests and things so that we can perhaps see them, maybe a blood test or something that we can identify ovarian cancer at an earlier stage? Yeah, it's definitely something that uh, we are working on. So when we are trying to anticipate those changes, we are also looking for specific signatures that cancer cells they might, uh, uh, they might have. And so we are trying to, maybe we can, with these specific signatures, uh, we, we, we can detect those signatures earlier when uh, there's no symptoms. Like the problem is that uh, ovarian cancer and pancreatic cancer, they don't show symptoms, right? Uh, when they do show something, it means that the, the disease is already advanced. So by studying all those changes, maybe we can find some signatures, specific signatures. Uh, ovarian cancer does have uh, one uh, signature. There is one protein that it's increased uh, uh, with the ovarian cancer. But uh, even though we we do a blood test to, to try to find, it's not uh, we are not able to to the, the protein is increased only when case when the cancer is already uh, spread out. So that's one of the things that we need to improve. We need to improve those biomarkers in order to, to, to improve early diagnosis. Fabiana, thank you very much. We really appreciate you. Uh, <laughs> you spending time with us and all the research you're doing. We're gonna move on now, but again, we'll bring you back at the end if other people have questions. But now I'd like to introduce Dr. Victoria Blaho. Victoria is an assistant professor in the Sanford Burnham Prebus Infectious and Inflammatory Diseases Center and the NCI Designated Cancer Center. She studies how lipid signals direct production of immune cells, how they communicate with blood vessels, and the decisions they make that lead to the development of diseases like multiple sclerosis. Dr. Blaho, thank you for joining us today. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be able to share with you one of the projects in my lab and how we're moving forward on some creative new therapies that could help improve women's health in ways you might not have expected. So my lab works on something you've heard a lot about this past year, the immune system. In particular, we're interested in understanding how a specific protein that's associated with good cholesterol affects the immune system and autoimmune disease. And there are two broad research goals with regard to this protein. One is whether it can be used as a marker to determine if patients' disease uh, will progress in severity or if they'll respond to certain therapeutics. And two, we want to create an artificial version of this protein that could be a much, much more effective treatment to target specific parts of the immune system with fewer side effects than traditional drugs. So when we talk about the immune system compared to the nervous system or the circulatory system, a lot of times it's not really clear what the actual components of the immune system are. So the immune system starts out with blood and lymph and their components, the immune cells like red blood cells or platelets or the cells that make antibodies. And it also includes the antibodies themselves as well as other proteins and fats like good cholesterol. 
Um, the immune system also includes the vessels that carry lymph through our bodies and the organs that those vessels are connected to, including the lymph nodes and the bone marrow. And all of these work together as the immune system to look for damage to repair or germs to kill. And this gives us immunity. So the system works amazingly well, actually, considering the enormous number of threats that it faces on a daily basis, including keeping itself in check. But like any fine machine, there can be a time when the brakes don't quite work and our immune system will begin attacking itself and the body it's supposed to protect. And that's autoimmunity. And some autoimmune diseases are familiar to most of us, like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or multiple sclerosis or MS. Um, but what you may not know is that women are actually four times as likely as men to develop an autoimmune disease. And this is increasing. Back in the 1950s, it was three times as likely. And since we all have immune systems, why are women affected so much more than men? Um, you know, there's some obvious reasons like hormones and genetics, um, but there's also some less obvious reasons too. Now, remember, besides cells, blood and lymph are chock full of proteins and fats. And this includes good cholesterol or HDL. And it turns out that when you have less good cholesterol, male or female, you are more likely to develop an autoimmune disease. Now, on average, women have higher amounts of uh, of good uh, cholesterol. Uh, so their immune systems are kind of programmed to expect this higher level of HDL. So if it drops, even just to what's average for men, uh, that increases our chances uh, to develop an autoimmune disease by one and a half to two times as much as men with the same amount. So, I mean, if that's the case, why don't we just try to raise the HDL of lupus and MS patients? But unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as that. It's a bit more complicated uh, because some women with autoimmune disease, again, especially diseases like lupus, can have really high HDL, but that's actually a bad thing for them. So how can that be? Now, although we like to think of HDL as just one fat glob kind of floating through our bodies, it's actually a tiny, dense ball full of lots of different fats and proteins all tightly packed together and an incredibly complex mix of 200 different types of fats and 80 different proteins. And a change in just one of those can have profound effect on whether or not our HDL keeps being the good cholesterol. And it's one of these proteins, APOM, that my lab is interested in. And just like the cartoon in this picture of an actual HDL particle, you can see APOM detected by a yellow fluorescent marker sticking out of the HDL particle, which is very special because only about 5% of HDLs have APOM. Now we're just beginning to understand the role of APOM in diseases, but so far that little 5% of APOM positive HDL is enough to have a big effect on many different cell types. For instance, in a model of multiple sclerosis, mice without APOM on their cholesterol get much worse disease faster than normal mice with APOM because their immune cells are hyperactivated and attack the brain and spinal cord. And although we know that MS patients with low HDL have more symptom flares, we haven't yet had the chance to measure their APOM yet. And in human diseases where APOM has been measured, like in lupus, the amount of APOM was lowest in patients with the most severe disease. And currently there are drugs for MS and some other autoimmune diseases like ulcerative colitis that sort of bypass some of what we think APOM is supposed to do. But unfortunately, they don't just affect the immune cells, they affect a lot of other cells everywhere else in the body. And we think the way to improve targeting for therapies in some autoimmune diseases is to have something that isn't just a drug molecule, but actually fills in more of the steps that drugs miss, like actual APOM HDL would. So like I said, HDL is a really complex molecule with hundreds of different lipids and proteins. So really all we need to do 
is make something that's a bare bones scaffold carrying ApoM that cells think tastes as good as real ApoM HDL, even if it's not quite as pretty. Now, this will be an incredible advancement, not just as a tool for researchers like me, but potentially as a therapy for treatment of numerous progressive autoimmune and other diseases where ApoM levels being too low has been implicated. And I hope that at some point in the future, I have the opportunity to share that news with you. Thank you. So your lab is looking at sort of creating a synthetic APOM. Am I, I just want to make sure I'm getting this correctly. So please correct me if I'm wrong. Sort of a synthetic APOM that we could give to patients and, and could be taken up by the good cholesterol and that may lessen the severity of the disease? Would it reverse the course of the disease? So the idea would be that we would have a kind of, they're called disks, um, nano disks, and they just have a couple of the same fats in them that HDL has. And then you make a separate APOM protein and then you put them together. And then the APOM kind of sticks out of it like a little lollipop. And you can take that nano disc with APOM and load it up with all sorts of other things, whatever else you need for whichever disease you're looking at. And you can inject that. And the idea would be that it could um, lessen the severity of symptoms. It could possibly prevent relapses. It could... Um, maybe even stop the progression of some diseases, depending on how exactly um, in that circumstance APOM is normally utilized. And so let's talk about that normal utilization of APOM. What is its normal job? And is there any danger in having too high a level of APOM? So um, normally APOM, is used, again, it's only on 5% of good cholesterol. And it goes around and it will activate uh, receptors. It, carries, it actually carries around something that activates specific cell receptors. And that's really the most important part of APOM is the fact that it's piggybacking on HDL and it's carrying this other thing that then binds to these receptors and activates all these different cells in different ways, very specific different ways. So um, uh, what was the second question? Sorry. Is there a danger of, of oh. did you have your levels of APOM are too high? So um, in mice that have say, I believe nine times as much as normal APOM levels, um, we haven't found, nobody's found anything that's really detrimental at baseline. Um, and so far as we can see in all the human diseases where APOM has actually been measured, which is not necessarily an easy thing to do, um, none has correlated, more severe disease has not correlated in any circumstance that I'm aware of where APOM is high. A um, couple questions from the audience. One was, does estrogen increase APOM synthesis and what entities regulate APOM synthesis? That's one question. That's, that's a very good question. Um, a very intelligent audience. Yes, that's, that's a very insightful question, yes. Um, so it's not really clear what regulates APOM synthesis, actually. Um, APOM was just discovered uh, we actually, in my old lab, we just found out what APOM was doing, um, let's see, maybe eight years ago. Um, it was just, it was discovered a little bit earlier than that, but nothing was really done on it. So um, it, we haven't really kind of figured out exactly what regulates uh, APOM synthesis, whether it goes up or down. Um, so then this may be related also from the audience. Um, so if women increase their HDL via diet, can there be a decreased risk of autoimmune disease or less severity in those with active diseases? Or is the diet not power, alone not powerful enough to make those adjustments? So the tricky thing with HDL 
is that it's a lot more there's there's one thing that we know of besides drugs that can really boost your hdl up and that's exercise um diet can affect your ldl but it can't affect uh hdl very much um it can help a little bit but it won't really bump it up a lot exercise is the one thing that can really boost it up and it can it can boost it up a substantial number of points and would that be enough to affect potentially i potentially it could be um as long as other factors were taken into account you know as long as people were taking care of other things um you know but obviously if you're if you're going through the effort of you know watching your diet and increasing your exercise to healthy levels and things like that you're already doing a lot of the things that you really need to do to kind of stave off all sorts of diseases and contributing factors Dr. Balaho, thank you. Um, we brought everybody else back because I really want to ask a question because the the two or the three topics that we talked about today, but really two, cancer and autoimmune diseases, are sort of at a at a. This is an issue I know in terms of medical science. Okay, so for cancer, we want to increase the immune system's response, but in autoimmune diseases, we want to decrease the immune system's response. How do we how are we able to do that in both of these cases and not tip over to the, you know, how do, how do we increase the immune system response in cancer and not tip over and create an autoimmune disease? And how do we turn down the immune system's response in autoimmune disease and not leave us open to cancer or other diseases? So um, I'm going to throw that out there and let you guys, uh, well, tell you what, Victoria, you've been talking for a little bit. So let's go, we'll go to Svasti and to start and then maybe Fabiana and we'll go through everybody. So, um, I, that's a really great question, Joe. And I think uh, to some extent that is what we're struggling with. Mm -hmm. And I think the immune system is so complex that the immunotherapies that we currently have for cancer, for example, although they, they seem to work and they seem like a brilliant idea to get like your immune system defending itself against cancer and like keeping this lookout to stop cancer cells from growing, converting that to reality is really hard. And on one uh, hand, you get end up having like cytokine storms, which came up with the COVID um, uh, uh, stuff earlier this year or last year as well, where you have these cytokine storms that really cause um, much worse side effects than actually dealing with the cancer itself or the virus in the case of COVID. And we also now know uh, from cancer that as Victoria was saying and Fabiana, there are so many components to the immune system that finding a way to balance it so that you're targeting the right parts of the immune system to alert it while also uh, putting the other parts of the immune system to sleep or calming it down so that it doesn't overreact to the situation is, is a really tricky balance that we're dealing with. And one of the things that I think both Victoria and Fabiana spoke about and what we work in our lab is that estrogen or hormones seem to actually play a really important role in this immune regulation as well. I think fundamentally men and women are different and at least some of it is hormonal and that affects every single part of our bodies. And that's a thing that we really have to take into account now as we come up with new therapies and better ways to deal with cancer and autoimmune diseases. Yes, uh, definitely, yes. Uh, was, uh, uh, you pretty much summarized our talks, Joe, <laughs> like we want to <laughs> silence the immune system for autoimmune, autoimmune disease and cancer. We want our immune system to actually uh, respond. And it's not, it's not an easy balance, but definitely like for the past 10 years and with uh, the advance of the immunotherapy in cancer, like there is no, we know that there is no uh, cancer research or even cancer treatment without considering the immune system at all. Because like um, when we are treating cancer, like we know that, okay, the, the immune system is going to be affected. So the person is more prone to infections. Like we know, we know that, but there wasn't other concerns besides uh, uh, risk of other uh, other diseases, uh, like secondary uh, diseases with cancer treatment. Now we know that like we cannot treat cancer without the immune system, and and this is this is this is great. I'm not an immunologist uh, as Victoria, but as I said, I cannot work without 
the immune system. So we, we, we need to study. Um, yeah, and I, and I would say al alternate, alternatively, the, the biggest problem with uh, treatments against uh, autoimmune diseases has been the risk of, of suppressing the immune system too much mm -hmm. and developing cancer um, because the pathways that seem, a lot of the pathways that seem to be the most highly activated are exactly the ones that we need to activate the most to, you know, keep cancer, you know, keep cancer in check, keep it away. And so that's, that's a very tough balancing act to be able to find that exact pathway. You know, what exactly can we, you know, what, what really is involved in causing the autoimmune disease? What is the source of it? As opposed to all these other pathways, like with, you know, the, the COVID inflammatory response, you know, those things aren't involved in fighting the virus. A lot of times those are just there because of the activation mm -hmm. so that's the biggest thing that's the biggest challenge for us is to find that one special pathway or those two or three special pathways that we can really suppress without suppressing the anti-tumoral response i know i know we're running short on time but just to add to that you know one of the amazing risk factors if you have predisposition to cancer like Lynch syndrome or a defect in dna damage repair if you're more prone to allergies it's actually one of the best ways of figuring out whether you'll have lowered risk, even though you have this genetic mutation. So it's almost like we have to start studying it more holistically to understand how these different parts interplay also in terms of how it tells us how a patient will respond or how a woman will develop cancer eventually. So I think it's actually fascinating and we're only scratching the surface at this point. It's, it's definitely a great question. We are coming up at the end. There are a couple questions that we're not going to have time for, and I would just like to let those people know that we will email those questions to our researchers. But there's one more question here that I want to tackle because I want to be sensitive to this. Um, we had a woman who sent us a question. She says she is the daughter of a male breast cancer survivor. And so she wants to know, is there a danger of characterizing breast cancer only as a women's disease? Now, obviously we're talking about women's health issues today and breast cancer overwhelmingly, the overwhelming majority of people are women, but is there a danger of characterizing breast cancer only as a women's disease? And Svasti, I would put that to you right now, I think. Yeah, you know, uh, another thing that you're totally right, there is a danger of that because when men get breast cancer, it's normally a lot worse and they're much less responsive to standard care therapies. And I'll tell you the most interesting part is men who get breast cancer are much more likely to get estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's the, it's the type of breast cancer that we associate with hormonal regulation in women. But in men, when we treat them with the same standard therapies that interrupt the hormonal balance, it doesn't work probably because men's hormonal wiring is not the same as women's. And so this is something that really needs to be studied more. And I think there have been recently some initiatives to start sequencing male breast tumors, to start trying to understand what are the actual molecular differences between these two and not just take it as surface value, it's estrogen receptor positive, it's hormone dependent because it's not. So yeah, I think that's, that's a really great question and thank you for bringing that up. I will say one other thing, one of my other patient advocates is actually a, a man who has a susceptibility gene, which puts him at higher risk for breast cancer and his mom died of breast cancer as well. So this is something we talk about a lot about how it's often the ignored part of breast cancer. So just really a great question. It was, and again, what I was saying is thank you so much to the person who, who brought it up. I wanna thank all of our presenters and thank all of you for joining us. As always, our presentation was recorded and it will be emailed to everyone who registered. If we didn't get to your question, we will email those to our researchers and get you a response. So if you still have a couple of questions, feel free to use the Q&A box. We so appreciate that you take an active role in learning about our research. You can learn about our other research at some of these other upcoming uh, Insights events. And here's a list of those that are coming up in the next few months. And if you'd like to learn more about or contribute to any of our research, please contact me at either the email or phone number that will appear on your screen. Thank you so much for attending today. Again, feel free to share this with your friends and colleagues. And thank you so much for your interest in our science. Have a great day.